there. I'm Christina Hergenrader, the author of Family Trees and Olive Branches. Welcome to our conversation about one of the most important parts of your life, your family. Over the next several weeks, we'll talk about how you can create a culture of grace in your family. We'll dig into the soil of your family tree. We'll talk about the roots of past generations and the fruit of the next generation. We'll look at what the newest buds in your family tree are learning about God's love for them. So let's start digging. I want to tell you a story about family trees, specifically one of my favorite trees. For as long as we've lived in our house, this big oak tree with gorgeous strong limbs has given us shade and stood as a pretty part of our front yard. We live near Houston, Texas in a suburb full of gorgeous trees but this one has always stood out as especially majestic. This tree happened to be a very good climbing one and our kids and their friends loved to see how high up in the branches they could go. Our daughter Katie is 14 and just starting high school. Our twins Sam and Elizabeth are 12 and they're about to start middle school. And our youngest son Nate is in the fourth grade. This particular tree had been the place where they had made so many good memories. In the middle of a lot of change, as they were getting older and spending less time climbing trees, this one had served as an icon of their favorite childhood memories. What we didn't realize is that this beloved tree had also been slowly dying. Over several months, the leaves turned a dark green and then black. Then the limbs started to fall off. Finally, the big branches were starting to fall to the ground. More than once, when my husband Mike and I would come back from a walk, he would look at the tree and say, it's dead. I couldn't imagine a tree could just die. And so I always had some hopeful strategy. Maybe it's just going through a bad season or let's try and water it. Clearly my understanding of trees is limited because water does not help a tree this far gone. We called out an arborist and asked if there was something we could do to save this beloved tree. He looked at the kind of rot that was happening from the inside of the branches and then took soil samples to see what might be going on. Apparently, there was a disease deep in the dirt around the tree's roots that had probably been there for the past 20 years. He pronounced the tree dead and ordered its eviction. He did say we could eventually plant smaller trees there, but this huge oak tree had lived too long with that disease deep in its roots. If we didn't take it out soon, our house was in danger. Eventually the tree would fall over and cause catastrophe for our home and family. Mike and I knew we had to take down the tree, but we weren't sure what to do next in the front yard. The old oak tree had provided so much good shade for us and the front yard would look so bare without its canopy of branches. And secretly, I think we both felt a little guilty. We wondered if maybe we could have done something to save it earlier. Should we have known the signs of infection? All those times that Mike looked at it and worried over it, should we have brought out a tree doctor to save it? We are notoriously bad with house plants. Maybe if we had been better with plants, could we have given it extra nutrition, more sunlight, looked for something obvious that was poisoning the soil? And the truth is, we have since learned a lot about trees and the fact that the types of bacteria that are in the soil can either nurture a tree or kill it. We might see the fruit, the green leaves, the branches so strong they can support several kids and squirrels and birds and nests and owls, but actually much more is going on with a tree than what you can see when you admire your front yard. So a couple days later, the crew came out to take the tree they scaled it and started to destroy it limb by limb. My office is high up in our house in a little nook that overlooks the front yard and I watched them all day. As those guys cut down the last bit of trunk and then came back in the afternoon to grind the stump, I thought a lot about what we could put in that spot. The arborist had given us a whole list of smaller trees with shallow roots that would work. I was anxious to fill up the bald patch in the grass with something new and beautiful. Over the next few months, we figured out a new direction for our front yard. We planted the prettiest new tree in that place and we love how our front yard looks now. 
I write about families, and so I know how important our family trees are to who we are. I also know the problems that can infect family trees for generation. After we cut down our oak tree, we found new trees for our front yard. But your family is different. These are your people. There is no cutting down your family tree. Pay attention to what's happening in it now. This is your opportunity to investigate the soil, to prune what's hurting it, to give it the nutrition it needs, and to make this tree flourish. In this faith course, you'll have the chance to understand how your family can live in a culture of grace. You'll learn God's intention for your family and how you can better live out His love in Jesus. Your family, the one you're from and the one you're raising, is at the very deepest part of who you are. Your family is your blood, your heritage, your future, and your legacy. Your family is in your cells, your soul, your eyes, your heart. These people are your assignment in this world. God does not make a mistake about the family He placed you in. And you can't underestimate the effect your family has had on your life. Your family has formed your perspective about everything from who you vote for, for how you celebrate Easter, to what you believe about God. And just like actual trees, there is so much more going on in family trees than what we can see on the outside. Your family tree might look healthy from a distance, like say by the pictures you put on social media, but what's happening underneath the roots? What bacteria is in the soil? What problems might be infecting your family? None of us want the world to see the broken branches of our family tree. Like me, you probably want the world to believe that in your family tree, it's always inside jokes, loving support, family game nights, picture-perfect vacations. The soil has the exact right balance of good bacteria and those previous generations provided the right nutrients and long-standing traditions and examples of grace. Their lessons have stuck with each of the people in your family and your clan shows God's perfect love to each other in every way. I've talked with enough families to realize this just isn't true. Every family struggles with the same problems. Pride, the inability to forgive each other, apathy, hurt feelings, sibling rivalries, bad boundaries, and festering problems that everyone is too scared to talk about. Once I started to talk to friends about the hidden problems in families, I realized that this is a crisis. So many of us are carrying around the hurt about our families. So many of us are settling for dying family trees. So many of us are accepting there is no better nutrients for the roots of our family tree. We're okay with pretending it's okay for our families to merely survive. Except, God wants us to thrive in our families and in cultures of grace. As I begin to study families and to listen to the stories of those who were struggling, I heard about so many people who were battling deep hurt, family fights, bad habits, grudges, and apathy toward each other. These sins were eating away at so many families. And once I knew the truth about these families, I couldn't unsee it. What were the answers here? What was the better way? What hope could there be for families who wanted better? The answers would come from the Bible, of course, because for thousands of years, God has shown us that family is at the center of His plan. God loves families and tells us that this can be the place where we learn about His grace firsthand. Our Heavenly Father gives us a deeper love to root and ground our families in. On our own, it's just too hard. We need to be connected to the deeper, richer love that God provides through Jesus. You have to hear one of my favorite Bible verses from Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. And as you listen, think about your family. These verses point to Christ's perfect love, where our families are rooted and grounded. Listen to Paul's prayer for spiritual strength that gives us a beautiful description of what God's grace is like in our lives. 
For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. For several months as I wrote this book, I thought so much about those words. Paul explains how every family can be rooted in God's deep, strong love. When we are, these important nutrients of God's grace and love flow all the way down to our inner being of our souls. Everyone in our families can be rooted together in this love. These families can know Christ's love in such an intimate way that they would only be able to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth in the deepest part of their souls. This is the place to root and ground your family. This is the good soil. Over the next several weeks, we'll look at families who are doing this. You'll hear what this deep grace looks like between siblings and parents, grandparents, kids. We'll look at important family moments at holidays and in hospital hallways and see how these families are living out God's love from their inner beings. For many of these families, there had been so much poisonous soil around their trees. There had been alcoholic grandparents or abusive parents they had gone through the hardest time with family splits and sibling rivalry that was never resolved. But these parents and grandparents understand the rich love of Christ and have allowed God to heal them from the inside out. They had responded to his call to lose their pride, to let him soften their hearts, and to live out the grace they received from him. You'll also hear about families who are struggling with sin that keeps eating away at their family trees. You might recognize some of this sin in your own family. When relationships get awkward, you shut down and ignore those you love. When some family member hurts your feelings, you shy away from talking about it. Or you love your family member so much and they seem so sacred that you don't want to do anything that might damage the bond. You might have terrible boundaries and avoid anything with genuine truth. With that, you might be giving up so much of the richness of what can come with these people that God has assigned to you. Remember that God is telling us that our families here on earth are named in the deep richness that is rooted and grounded in this amazing love from our Heavenly Father. This is the spiritual identity he gives to us. He has placed his name on each of us. This can handle the hardest conversations and the deepest work. We'll also talk about olive branches, the real hope for your family tree. We often think about olive branches meaning peace, but they actually represent something much more promising, new life. In the Genesis flood account, Noah and his family had witnessed the very worst destruction. They looked around at the ruin that was the entire world and couldn't fathom how life could continue. All they could do is trust in the Lord and his promise to them. But then a dove flies overhead with a branch from a beautiful green olive branch. This meant that everything wasn't dead. Somewhere there was food and the promise of more food. Noah didn't realize it yet, but God would grow a whole new world, one with enough trees and plants to one day sustain billions and billions of people. The water would wash away the old sinful world. This is just like baptism. God has washed away your sin, claimed you in your innermost being, and began building something new. This is your identity and God's family 
and it's where you understand the width and breadth and depth of Christ's love. This is the hope for you and also for all the generations of your family. Whatever is in the soil of your family tree, you don't have to watch it tear down the whole thing. You have access to this astounding love that Paul writes about. And through that, you can learn to forgive. You can trust your father that whatever old patterns your family is in can be reversed. You can trust him that the next generation can live a life full of olive branches. This is the message of this book. And I am so glad that you've joined me on this journey. Here's the even better news for you. Because family is a deep identity, you'll discover that when God heals you from the deep family issues, this also gets to the struggles that you've had deep in your soul for years. Your identity is entirely in Christ. You are a new creation in Him. And as this new creation, you are now able to see all the opportunities in your life to serve Him by serving your family. He has blessed you to be a blessing. But here is the best news of all. Trust that when your family shows each other this kind of love, when the next generation in your family tree understands it, this can change the whole world. Mother Teresa said that. After all the work she did in the world to help the poor and the suffering, she said the most valuable act that we can do to tell the world about our Savior is to love our own families. There are seven sections that we'll be studying over the next few weeks. First, we'll talk about the family filter and the culture in your family right now. Next, we'll look at God's deep love of families and your dual citizenship in both God's family and your people here on earth. We'll look at how pride can be the most damaging sin that erodes your family tree. Then we'll study how God's grace can help your family be flexible when conflict blows through the branches of your family tree. We'll talk about Jesus's parable about the prodigal son and how sibling rivalry can infect your family. And as you build a better family tree, we'll look at the boundaries your family needs. Finally, we'll talk about 49 strategies you can use to create a culture of grace in your family. Throughout this book, there are lots of journal prompts, chances to think about both the family you're from and to think about the one you're raising. Each week, you'll have homework. You'll read the chapter and do the activities in your book before the next meeting. I can promise you that you'll get so much more out of this Bible study if you put serious time into it. Plan an hour or two each week to dive into the questions and your journal and to really think about your family the deepest parts of yourself and your identity in Christ. You'll get to experience Christ's love that heals your soul. A couple of tips. You will probably want to read the whole chapter first before you come back to do the activities. You might even want to break the reading up over a few days so you have plenty of time to think about what each chapter says. This will give plenty of time to let the spirit work and how you understand it. Also, when it comes time to do the activities, do the ones that appeal to you the most first and then come back to the ones that are more challenging to you. Finally, go with your first instinct, your gut feeling when answering these questions. It will help you to understand the deeper feelings, memories, and desires to write down what first comes to mind. You can always go back later and change it as new revelations come to mind. You will be glad you have all these answers written down. You might visit your responses again over the years as God transforms your heart and your family. So here's where we start. You are ready to discover which parts of your family need some work. You're about to tend to your family tree with renewing grace that will come straight from the creator of it all. Grab your book and your individual planning guide and let's go.
Hi there, and thanks again for joining me in this CPH Faith Course. I'm so glad you're here to learn more about how God has rooted and grounded your family in His never-ending grace. Let's take a look at the first section of the book, A Culture of What? We'll look at the family filter and your view of the world and how important this filter is to how you understand who you are and how you treat the world around you. Your family filter is wrapped so tightly around you that it can be hard to really identify it. This filter is the way you understand yourself, your world, and all kinds of other parts of your life, from money, to love, to food, to birthdays, to marriage, to God, to which political ideas you should support. This filter has helped you to create a culture in your family. As you read the book this week, you'll have a chance to examine your family filter up close. Get ready for some deep work as you make big discoveries about yourself and your family tree. The tools in this chapter will help you understand your family filter and to help you find places where God needs to change it. To understand the culture in your family, think about the last time you were at the hospital with them. Hospital hallways are where far-flung children come together to make decisions about their mom's last breaths. This is the place of births and sickness and healing and prayer and money struggles and hugs and tears and fights. What was the value of your family when you last gathered together at the hospital? Holidays, like hospitals, are another place where your family filter colors your expectations and your hopes and your hurts and your history. You probably have learned from an early age what celebrations mean. Maybe they're a time to eat the forbidden foods or to sit in the pew at Christmas Eve services or to get along with the people you fought with all year. You have learned the family traditions like you learned about the Easter Bunny and the words of Silent Night. What does it feel like to be at a holiday celebration with your family? Perhaps you grew up in a poisonous home environment, one that tainted your view of family and of God. Just like a tree, you didn't know this environment was harmful because it was all you had ever known. It wasn't until later, perhaps not until you began to raise your own kids, that you realized how your family of origin didn't provide an environment for grace to thrive. Your parents might have subtly punished you when you tried for independence, or your mom and dad taught you that success was so important they equated it with love. Perhaps you've realized that self-righteousness was so thick in the air of your home you are all choking on it. Or maybe, as you've had more experience with relationships, you've understood that what your parents taught you about boundaries wasn't very helpful or safe. Maybe your parents, in their best efforts to protect you, convinced you that the world was very scary and should be avoided. This is a culture of fear. If your parents were especially sensitive to what everyone else thought of your family, it's a culture of image. If your parents demanded you follow the rules precisely and punished you when you didn't, then a culture of control ruled. If your house was run by overworked, alcoholic, or mentally unstable parent, you might have grown up in a culture of chaos. These cultures teach kids that love has to be earned, or that it's scarce, or that it's tightly calibrated to performance. The trouble with all these cultures and the specific problem of passing them down to the next generation is that they don't help raise kids who understand their identity as God's children. In a culture of grace, kids see that they are valuable to the family. This truth is crucial for the way they receive and share love. Because in a culture of grace, kids don't feel like they're accepted only if they follow specific rules for success. They don't feel like they're only loved if they pretend to agree with you. They understand that you love them in spite of what they do, not because of what they do. Kids raised in a culture of grace understand that others have expectations for their behavior, that they won't always meet those expectations, 
but that they will always be loved because they belong to one another. I bet that a culture of grace is already a little bit a part of your family filter. For example, someone in your family probably told you about God's love. You are watching this video now, hoping to learn more about rooting your family in love because a parent or a grandparent did that for you. And this week, you will have the chance to write a letter to these ancient parts of your family tree and thank them for the grace that they lived out. Here is the most exciting part of understanding your family filter. You get to decide what culture you would like in your family now and for future generations. You can't change the past, but our God can redeem and change anything for the future. Every branch of your family tree can be filled with new buds. These are the olive branches, and these are from your Heavenly Father, who promises to give us real hope. This week, you'll read about the olive branches that God can grow in your family tree. We learned from Genesis 7 and 8 about the olive branch the dove brought back after the flood. It represented radical new life. Noah's family had just witnessed the worst destruction in the history of the world. For as far as they could see, there was only waste and disaster. But even after all the wreckage, the dove returned with an olive branch. Through this new life, God could restore everything on earth. One day the earth would be so fruitful that it could support billions and billions of people. Throughout this Bible study, We'll talk about olive branches as the symbol of hope and new life. God can transform anything in your family. He is the God of second chances and he is always after changing your heart. The same miracles that worked on Easter morning are at work right now in our relationships. In this section, you'll also meet Sean, one of my favorite friends. He's funny, energetic, loyal, and a great dad. He was raised in a family with gnarled family roots of alcoholism and divorce. When Sean was eight years old, he watched his house burn down from a cigarette that had been left burning. He was moved around several times after that. A few months later, as he was climbing in the car with his mom, his grandma pulled him out of that car. His mom, who had been drinking, left without him. That day, his mom hit another vehicle and was killed. Sean says, it was a miracle I was not in that car. God had something more for me. Sean wouldn't discover what else God had for him for several more years. During his years as a rebellious teen, tough years with an unloving stepmom, and dips into drugs and alcohol, Sean struggled to know what God wanted him to do with his life. It was when Sean married Connie, and when they had Henry and Sammy, that he discovered that this is what God had been preparing him for. God wanted Sean to be the transformative generation in his family. And now, Sean is just that. He is raising his boys in a radically different culture than the one where he was raised. Sean is constantly breathing the life of the Holy Spirit into his sons, building them up in the Lord, teaching them about real love by living it with them. Sean says, my goal for my boys is that they would have hearts anchored in Jesus and filled with the Spirit. I don't want them always searching for the next thing. I want them to know whose they are. They belong to God. Let's dig around in the soil around your family tree and talk about family filters. Let's see what God is doing in your family.